innovation isn't just this free flowing spark yeah. of creativity it it. actually it's it's a rigorous process they really have to be bold enough to commit to uh, outcomes not outputs one piece of advice i would say to anybody working in innovation or is looking to facilitate or lead a team is um, do use these methodologies and frameworks to create structure this current decade 2020 to 2030 has been described um, as the decade of action our current you know operating system if i can call it that is, is failing us and there are many evidences of that failing across societies so what is the point of innovating if we're if we have no, no, no future to protect welcome to the conversation today we are talking with danielle zane of radical everyone tackling what innovation truly is the five layers of innovation and how they exist across horizons creative intelligence and problem solving with systems thinking and why our current systems are failing us. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi there. Today we're here with Danny Elzane. Danny is an innovation consultant and has been specializing recently in the area of sustainability. So Danny, in your own words, tell us a little bit more about what that means. Hi, um, pleasure to be here first of all. Nice to see you again, Johnny. So, um, Innovation um, is about fundamentally changing the future. And when we think about the future, we can't think about it without considering sustainability. And for me, the two are synonymous with, with one another. So es essentially, innovation is about applying things that exist out there in a knowledge base, in different walks of life, and bringing them together to change reality, challenge paradigms that we know to be true today, and to create new ones. And it's a continuous process. And when we think about layering sustainability as part of that, it's about then innovating with an intent, a strong intention to piece things together, to make a positive impact, and to do that within the, the, planet, the planetary boundaries with the resources, the resources that we have. It's about not creating waste, it's about creating more um, equality and equity. So really, it's about how can we change our reality to better serve us and, and, and our planet. Incredible. And what role can innovation play with the businesses that are trying to go on, on this journey with you? Well, let's debunk the term innovation a little bit more because it's so, <clears throat> it's so generic. Um, and it means different things to different people. Now, there are essentially five maturity levels, I should say, that could classify where an organization is on that journey um, of being innovative. And the first is, can be described as serendipitous innovation, is when you have that lone, uh, you know, outsider, uh, rule breaker, someone who wants to do something differently and is doing that within a small pocket in the organization, but it's no executive support, it's not connected to anything else in the organization. The second level is um, as we describe it, emerging innovation. Emerging innovation is when the company recognizes that there's a need for an innovation function. They need to innovate um, as part of their strategy. And they set up uh, some resources dedicated to doing so. And that works to an extent. But again, it's not connected to business as usual. Um, and sometimes it can be done in isolation and you don't see the impact. Mm. The third level could be described as uh, coordinated uh, innovation. And that's um, it's the next level up in the sense that it's uh, greater supported, it's connected to different business units within the organization. There's more of, more of a drive that it's going to shape the future of how the business uh, works. Then you have transformative, which takes another step forward. Now that's at the strategic level. Uh, the organization um, may appoint a chief innovation officer and you uh, have a very strong uh, strategy across uh, different horizons of innovation, so different timelines, and I'll talk about that in a second. And, and the, final, the final one is uh, innovation-driven organizations. So that is where innovation is everywhere. It's, um, you know, it's part of the mindset, it's part of the culture, it's, uh, everybody's responsible for driving innovation, and it's driven both from the top down and the bottom up, and, um, and, the, and the company is willing itself to completely disrupt how 
their work today, their fundamental business model today, to evolve and, and move forward. Uh, so they're not afraid of taking those risks. Mm -hmm. It's all about if there is an opportunity to innovate, to change things, no matter how disruptive, we're willing to do it uh, or enter a new market or an industry. And there are a ton of good companies. I maybe, was going to ask you know, if there's any uh, examples that you can think of off the top of your head uh, on, on those types of companies. Yeah. Um, so uh, a company I admire uh, a, a lot and a company I used to work for, Apple. We all know Apple. Um, I think they have always been uh, recognized uh, as, a, as an innovative company. They're, you know, if you think about the number of teams that exist, um, whether it's this focus on the UI components, the hardware, the materials that are going to be used in the devices, whether it's about the software, the integration of the hardware and the software, um, the new services that have emerged, um, so now they're moving more to the service-led led business. What The story about Apple is really interesting because um, fundamentally, they are a box manufacturer, traditionally. They created motherboards in boxes, and that's where they started off. And they constantly innovated on that, added UI, made it better, improvement, performance, etc. And in around 2016, you start to see the whole market mature to a point where there is very, very little differentiation between what Samsung might do, what Apple might do, what Microsoft might do. And you started to see declines in, in, in sales. Um, the strategy and business model was about charging higher for premium for the quality of the products. But again, the margins became so small because everybody got really good at doing so. So they had to think about fundamentally changing their business, right? And um, there was a fundamental shift to 2016 where their CFO came out and said, we are no longer reporting by the volume of devices sold worldwide because that no longer represents what we do today and what we want to do in the future. And that took the whole kind of stock market by, by, by shock. He said, what do you mean? How are you going to perform on your sales? And the reason for that is because in the background, Apple were making a fundamental shift to move from hardware uh, or making boxes, being a manufacturer, to a service-led business. And they understood that the future value proposition existed outside of the box. It existed mm -hmm. as part of the ecosystem. It, ex it existed in, in the services. And that's where they started to think about where can we add value to people um, that is built on top of the foundations we already have, but it's adjacent to that. And that's where you started to see entrance into uh, where it's the health kit, uh, the Apple um, healthcare devices. Now we're looking at Vision Pro and mi mixed reality in the future, potentially in autonomous vehicles. Well, I mean, I mean, there's so much to unpack here. And I, the immediate question that strikes me is, what are the fundamentals that enable you to almost transition up those, those, those five layers of innovation. How do you go from that kind of serendipitous innovation to, you know, innovation driven? Mm -hmm. How do you bridge that chasm? Is there a mindset? Is there a certain set of beliefs or fundamentals that you need to instill in the team? From your experience, what's the, yeah, how, how do you bridge that divide? Because it, I can imagine it's quite a difficult one to, to gap to bridge. Absolutely, and this is where defining innovation could 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 be a helpful guide in understanding that. Um, the easiest way to think about innovation is across the Free Horizons model, something that was introduced by McKinsey um, many, many years back. And it describes that there are Free Horizons. Uh, the first described as core innovation. This is about innovating and improving what you do today and making that better, more efficient, uh, better performance, more cost-effective, um, incremental improvements, essentially. But that's still innovation to many. Mm. The second is known as Horizon 2 as adjacent innovation. So that's about looking at things that are n maybe not new in the market. They exist somewhere else, but they're new to us. They're new to the organization. It's not something that we've done before. Uh, and Apple going into streaming is a good example of that. And horizon three is disruptive innovation. It's about, it's new to the market, it's new to us, it's never been done before. So to go back to your question, you've got organizations who may say we're very innovative, you know, at core innovation at horizon one. We are the best 
of what we do today and we're constantly improving that and everybody has the responsibility to do that and we're innovation driven. Um, is that enough though? And does that protect you from the rapid changes that exist out there, the, 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 the newcomers, the potential disruption that may happen? Um, no, we can make a safe bet that that isn't enough. So then you look at Horizon 2 and then Horizon 3. So uh, a successful organization has to be more ambidextrous than ever at being able to innovate across all three horizons and have a balanced portfolio of transformation programs that work across all three and invest and put their resources behind uh, all three horizons. And there is a balance. You could, that could change. You could say, okay, 70% of all of our time and resources could be put, put on today and what the business we do today. So let's say Google, for example, their core business is search and advertisement. That's where they make most of their revenue. So 70% of their resources are optimizing that, the, the, the search engine, the advertisement, uh, and, and improving the algorithms, et cetera, to make them more effective. Ryzen 2 is maybe, you know, the acquisition of YouTube and going into streaming and look at YouTube today, incredible platform. Um, maybe this podcast will be on, on, on YouTube yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah. <clears throat> so absolutely incredible. And Horizon 3 and something people don't always think about um, and a company can play, so 70% in core Horizon 1, 20% in Horizon 2, and then 10%, which is still a significant chunk, should be focused on the really disruptive stuff, the moonshot ideas. And in Google's case, that could be Google's uh, autonomous vehicle software, which they started many, many years back. Um, so in the future, they could be, you know, controlling the, the experience in, 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 in how how the world moves and travels and interacts with data and along the way. Um, so for an innovation company to become truly innovation driven, there are quite a few components to, to tackle. Uh, you have to have a portfolio of projects that sit across all three horizons. You, the horizons need to be connected with one another. There's got to be um, a supportive culture to experiment and be willing to try things. And be bold and brave to take things on. But a really important component of that, in my opinion, is leadership. Is having leaders across the organization at any level, um, especially at the top level, who have the understanding and the ambition that change is, is necessary, is imminent, and they really advocate for even if, even if it means disrupting how you do things today, to have the willingness to, to persevere and, and, and move forward. And companies that have those, those leaders are often the ones that um, are, are innovating and, and, and moving forward. Mm. It's really interesting, actually, when you're talking about that leadership. I suppose one of the fundamental principles for that leader is to create an environment where people feel safe. You know, the willingness to be able to test things and, and I suppose to test things that may not always work to be truly innovative. In order for that to continually happen, you have to create an environment of safety and you have to create an environment where people are okay to fail. I guess another component of that is this idea of creative intelligence. And, you know, from from your perspective, what, is, what does that mean in terms of innovating and, and pushing things forward? What is, how important is creative intelligence in innovation? Yeah. So now we're talking about the magic sauce. <laughs> How do we stir the pot to come up with those breakthrough ideas? Uh, because we can have all the fundamentals, frameworks, leaders, everything in place. Um, but then we need to get down and to start collaborating and coming up with those breakthrough strategies, breakthrough ideas and thinking. So creative intelligence is a, uh, it's not a methodology, it's a mindset that complements innovation very well. Um, and it was first coined by uh, an agency called Sense Worldwide, um, an, an agency I had the pleasure of working with. And they describe three forms of intelligence, right, which we're aware of. We have uh, IQ, your intellectual intelligence. That's our ability to think rationally and be analytical um, and problem solve. The second, emotional intelligence, EQ, 
um, is taking more of a prominent role uh, in, in the last couple of um, decades. And that's about empathizing, um, putting yourself in other people's shoes, and it's about managing emotions, controlling emotions, influencing, uh, creating a safe environment. Very important to culture in, in general. And then one that isn't talked about that we are mentioning here is creative intelligence, CQ. And CQ is the ability to understand, interpret, and act with imagination. It is something that we all have as children, naturally, it's innate to us, it's, it's a very human skill. And arguably it's the most important skill of the 21st century. It's in a world of AI automation, uh, you know, generative AI, et cetera. Um, you know, machine learning is very good at doing certain things, but creativity is not necessarily uh, one of them, or at least in the, same, in, in, in the same shape or form. So the idea of creative intelligence in any culture is, is this ability to, which is really crucial to innovation, is to take things that may seem completely disconnected from one another. I mean, there are, um, there are five principles that are associated with creative intelligence and how to, how to practice it. Um, at an in, let's say at an individual or at a small group level, and then we can talk about what that might look like when you expand it across the organization. Uh, I'll, I'll quote some of them. I mean, um, expanding our mindset is, is a big part of that. So um, how do we seek perspectives outside of our own to help us give a fresh view on the topic, the challenge that we're addressing, and, and see it from a different perspective and constantly challenging uh, which is the second principle, is challenging our default, uh, challenging our biases. We all have unconscious biases that, are, that have come about our experiences in life. Um, and we need to challenge those with completely fresh perspectives because you never know what you might learn and you've got to be open and confident to, to doing so. Um, and that's maybe harder than it seems for many people, um, this whole idea of you know seeing seeing things from a beginner's eye, as you as as you mentioned, it's you know when you have an expert deep knowledge of something um, in an industry, you you are less willing to let go of your biases um, that you've uh, accrued over time. You're the expert, you know you you know this. I've done mm. this for years. You know who are you to tell me that this should be done differently? Uh, but actually, you know if you are going to innovate coming up with something from a completely different industry or space um, or opinion could, could just completely flip something on its head and, and, and create something far more impactful. So uh, ch being willing to challenge your biases is, is key, um, expanding your mindset by different bringing, bringing different perspectives. Um, and having an experimentative mindset is, is, is another one of those principles. Be willing to, to try, build a narrative, be willing to break it again build it up again, keep, keep breaking it, keep building it up again until it makes sense with every iteration. How do you embed that? Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting watchword probably for anyone seeking to co construct or recruit for their creative teams in having that, I guess, cognitive diversity in the team. How do you ensure that, uh, or how you ensure that that happens, I guess, comes down probably more for a HR question or some other than in innovation, but... Um, how, from your experience, have you seen that play out? And how has that worked in, in some of the projects that you've been involved in? You were spot on there by identifying cognitive diversity as being a key enabler or the enabler for creative intelligence. Uh, the power, imagination, um, and, and innovation to develop it's the cornerstone of developing breakthrough ideas. Um, and the way to describe it is, you know, if you imagine society and you put it on a bell curve, you know, majority of people will sit in that median. And then you have the few outliers, people that sit on the edges of society. Those are the, the misfits, the outliers, the crazy ones, in, in, as Apple's very old um, mm. and famous launch of uh, the Macintosh think when they were going up against IBM. Think different, exactly. And that's who they were targeting and that's how they managed to make those people more into the mainstream and the creatives, that's who they, they, were, they were targeting at the time. So if you didn't have cognitive diversity 
and everybody was the same. The thinking, the experience, the biases uh, will, will be very conforming and you will only generate ideas that are similar to one another, maybe a slight change in opinion, but not fundamentally different. Now, let's say you are creating a product, a cleaning product uh, for Johnson & Johnson uh, to clean, clean the loos, okay? And you go out there, you do your user research, and you ask people their opinion, you know, what do you want? Yeah, well, I want to kill 99.9% .9 bacteria in the loo. Great, okay, so we create a product that does that. Great, you go and launch it. Now, what if one of the people they interviewed wasn't that bell curve and they had extreme OCD? And you speak to them and you ask them a few questions and they tell you that the idea of cleaning something, let's say using a brush and then putting it back where that bacteria may still exist, will drive them absolutely insane. And then it makes you think, oh, wow, okay, so we can't just have a liquid form product because ultimately there is still, you know, you're still transferring that bacteria elsewhere potentially. And that's, that's kind of re really, really bad. Defeats the whole purpose. Another great example, there was a utensils company, the name esca escapes me, very, very famous, won a lot of awards for inclusive design. Um, the founder, um, the founder's wife uh, suffered from a, from a disease, I believe it may have been Parkinson's, and he really struggled watching her struggle to, to continue cooking and making things in the kitchen um, due to kind of the, sh the shaking of hands. So the current utensils were one fit for purpose. And that didn't sit right with him. So he, he went away and he started exploring. And he, st he came up with this idea of thicker hand grips on everything, and which made it much more easy to use. Now, that was better for her, but actually it was better for everybody else. And now they're one of the most award-winning um, and expensive products. I know you like your kitchen utensils, John. I do, I do. So I'll find <coughs> the name for you and, and, and for the viewers. Uh, but it's a fantastic bit of piece of product design. Uh, and again, it was informed by an extreme perspective. How do you protect, though, against those ideas when you're looking towards those fringes and those edges for those perspectives? How do you protect against the wrong bets? That's kind of the, I guess, the question for the leaders and the, uh, the guys where they say, yeah, that is an extreme view, but it seems like a sensible bet. How do you balance innovation with reality and realism is it is it coming back to that breakdown that you said where you've got that 70 percent 20 percent 10 percent uh where those moon shoot projects only make up the 10 so you don't disrupt the whole thing so now i want to talk about um a good way to view this is is to start thinking about problem solving mm. uh, when you're thinking about innovation seeking perspectives using your imagination ultimately you're applying all of that to solve a problem uh and problems take different forms. They have levels themselves. And um, a very famous systems thinker and architect designer called uh, Dr. Russell Ackoff um, had a really interesting way to break down problems. He said there are, there are four types of problems you've got, or dealing with problems. You've got problem absolution, which is about um, avoiding the problem which is what most of us do day to day, right? You know, you know you're meant to do something, it's a problem, you know, but I'm, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna ignore it and hope it goes away. The second is problem resolution. It's about looking to the past and finding the most optimum, uh, looking to the past and using that to, to solve the problem today. It's about just resolving it with what you know. The second is problem solving which is what we get taught in school, which what most of us practice and are taught to do at work, at school. And that is about taking the problem, uh, understanding it, and then finding the most optimal solution to tackling it, right? But solving a problem in one place can often misplace it and create a, another problem elsewhere. So the final level of problem solving is called problem dissolving. It's about looking at the system within which the problem exists and changing the system so that problem no longer, is no longer there. Um, and that's really the power of systems thinking. So if you, in this idea of how do you know you're placing the right bet, 
um, first of all, spend a lot of time on contextualizing your problem before you jump into the, the solutions. And I think the extreme perspectives help you do that. It's not to say that they're necessarily right, you're collating, you're trying to level up the problem into a greater, into the greater system. Mm. You just keep leveling up and up and up. And then as part of the process, the, the better answer will, re will potentially reveal itself. The right questions to solving the right problem will reveal themselves. And, and, and seeking cognitive perspectives uh, is predominantly a tool to, to, to frame the right, the right challenge at the right level. Because if you can change the system, that problem no longer exists um, mm. and you can have a far wider impact and you can come up with far greater breakthrough idea. It's a really incredible point and I think that's one of the things that I think of a well-known coffee manufacturer or, or, or coffee capsule manufacturer who inadvertently created an environmental problem by introducing their solution for barista quality coffee at home. And that system's thinking lens could have avoided that problem because you would have realized that actually, you know, the glues, the plastics, the metals, probably not great um, at that sort of a scale unless you have a very clear cleanup mechanism for it that everyone can get behind easily and there's a lot of recycling and things like that. So I think that's a really key point that you have to think about things from a total system and ecosystem point of view. And that's where with our kind of side of things and my expertise in particular like with UX, that's why it's so important to go outside of that myopic view. Yeah, um, so doc, doc, Dr. Russell Ackoff uh, used this, he's a brilliant thinker, yeah? he used this analogy that can seem quite abstract, but he says that um, atoms, you know, um, atoms are to a table what problems are to reality. People experience tables not not atoms so if reality is just a combination of all these problems that you know that have created the world that we know today the question we should be asking is not how do we solve the problem but how do we change our reality uh, and the and how we experience things and, and and view things so um which is a really nice way of of, of saying um think about the bigger picture constantly frame mm. it, frame frame your challenge in that way and your problem and you will get to a better outcome perspective always nice so coming back to creative intelligence and how you foster that in teams and how you create the ultimate team for want of a better term is there a way of assembling that are there things that you can look for across different uh, spectrums of society to to build those teams and then a follow-up question to that is how do you protect against anarchy and chaos Okay, so um, the first part of that, there has been, there's been quite a lot of change happening in, in the industry and organizations uh, in terms of how teams are set up. You had, previously you had functions, and functions are excellent at doing what they do and doing that very well, but they're not very collaborative. You don't get those cross collaborative type ideas. So then you started getting those kind of cross cutting capabilities more being organized are more capability driven and more recently you have uh, broken silos they, they no longer exist and now you have squads teams right where you have and especially in an innovation lab environment you you will have a team that is solving a problem and would ex co coexist with people who have who are ux designers um, who are engineers um, people with subject matter expertise, uh, facilitators, all working, data scientists, all working together towards the same outcome. Um, and that's really powerful because they, they bring something different to the table. So that is the model the, the currently as accepted. And then you ask yourself, how do we make that, how do we optimize that squad to come up with better ideas and to work better at coming up with those breakthrough breakthrough thinking. Um, and there's some really interesting research being conducted by uh, an old colleague of mine, Dr. Adam Kitt. And he's looking at debunking the idea of what are those perspectives that need to come together, the optimum algorithm of humans thinking and imagination that could lead you to, to better ideas. 
And so he's taking multiple factors, such as the Miles Briggs personality types. So are you, uh, you know, ex some extroverts, some introverts, people that are more uh, feeling, overthinking, more judging versus... Um, and, and he is testing with previous projects that we've delivered and where we've, we've sought out those diverse perspectives. What is the perfect formula storm of different personality types, people with also different experiences. So if you're a, you know, if you're from a, a, a single country background or you're, you know, a third culture kid, that, that has a huge uh, impact on your way of thinking. Um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that you can assemble these amazing teams. It's almost like building your own A-team mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that are old enough to remember that. Um, and so, Coming back to the second part of the question then, so you've got these cognitively diverse group of individuals that you've recruited for. How do you make sure, I guess it's probably baked into the analysis, but how do you protect against chaos? How do you protect against uh, butting of heads where there's gonna be strong creative opinions and ideas maybe that are not aligned? Yeah, I mean, now we're talking about methodologies. Now we're talking about, we have everything, we have all the ingredients. How do you put that into action and, 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 and deliver in the right way? Um, and there are a ton, a ton of different methodologies, but one thing that grounds them all that's really important to think about is, uh, is collaboration. How, how do you collaborate and you pull on those people in the right way? Um, and there is something that we are all experiencing uh, in the industry called uh, collaboration chaos, uh, coined by a facilitation agency called AJ and Smart. Um, so I wasn't completely off the mark in saying that chaos no, could ensue. chaos is the right there word. There you go. Chaos is the right, I mean, how many, how many times have you been in meetings uh, where you have discussed something right to the hour and the only action was to go away and have another meeting or more actions uh, more to, to times take than away. I would care to, to remember yeah or you go away with your squad of uh, the A team and you come up with a, a great idea you, you bring it to your stakeholders and you play that back and they've not been part of the process so they have a different perspective they have their own agendas to bring into the fourth and um, they completely break it and they say no that's that's not what I wanted that's not how I see things and you're questioning, you then say, okay, do we go just change it completely? Even though we know that we might be on, on, onto the better path or do we just ignore them and then just carry on and doing things as we were, which also does happen. So this whole idea, this whole space has kind of been coined as the collaboration chaos. So how do you, uh, uh, how do you work, work that through? Yeah. And this is where, this is where methodologies could be, uh, in delivery methodologies could be really powerful and, uh, and something that I've been um, an early advocate of when it when it first came out is this idea of um, the design sprint methodology. Um, is um, is doing things in a concentrated amount of time, going through the the motions, the different stages of you know understanding the problem to bringing in inspiration, those diverse perspectives, to generating as many ideas as possible, to then converging on the ones that you know really have value, to then building the earliest prototype you can to then go and test to get those early, early learnings fast before you spend any resources of time building anything uh, and then taking those this and, and iterating on it and, and doing that super, super fast. And that's actually how um, Google came about working and they, if there was a new idea, a new project, they say, great, okay, we're not gonna give you funding for it. Run a design sprint for a week and yep. then tell me what the results are, validate your assumptions and and, and you know, let's see if this has potential. And if done, then great, then we'll move on forward. And Amazon has taken a similar approach as well. You see how much they've scaled and mm. how many uh, new markets and products and spaces they've entered. They have this, this idea of the, the press release statement. And it's this idea of, okay, you have an idea, write me a press release of before you build anything, you know, if this was to launch tomorrow, what, what would it look like? What would the business world say about it? What would customers say about it? Help bring it to life for us and then We'll, we'll work backwards from that to validate mm. that um, those ideas. So collaboration, chaos, how you tackle that, it all comes down to facilitation, applying methodologies such as design sprints, um, involving the right people along, along the perspectives, along the way, not doing things in isolation, um, 
and using tools. So making any in any knowledge that that is um, intrinsic explicit. So we all have the same knowledge base, the same understanding, um, and there are, there are d different ways to, to tackle that. And that. Yeah, I think I think this is resonating so much with me in terms of what I've seen as being successful in organizations is the making the intrinsic explicit mm -hmm. you know really sharing that knowledge because it is that siloed knowledge that will come back to bite you in the backside later where something wasn't considered that that should have been and you know it's worth pointing out here that obviously you do uh, these types of workshops and and, and specialize in, in pulling all of these um <clears throat> collecting all of this knowledge and really getting it out there and i think involving the right stakeholders is key as well in keeping them engaged but what i'm really hearing about this whole process is yes it's open yes it's open to bring all of the um knowledge out and the generation of ideas but it's done in a structured way it's not open for open sake it's not kind of completely just chaotic it actually has a structure to it and the fact that you said that there's a time boxing to mm -hmm. it there's a time component by which we say yes we're going to get this done by this point there's a gathering of stakeholders where it's kind of we need to have everyone in this in this room and i know from previous situations that those sprint sessions will not happen unless every single one of those stakeholders is there because otherwise it's you know that it's going to fall or you accept that that's going to be probably something that you're going to come crashing against later like waves on a shore so hearing that there's this structure, I think it, it gives people a lot more confidence in the fact that it's not just kind of innovation isn't just this free flowing spark yeah. of creativity. It actually, it. it's, it's a rigorous process. Very much so. And you need, to, you need to trust the process. You need to be very comfortable with ambiguity um, because you don't, know where you're gonna, you don't know where you're going to end up. And that's very difficult when it comes to organizations investing in, in an innovation project, mm. um, they really have to be bold enough to commit to uh, outcomes, not outputs. Uh, no matter what they might be, they might be, okay, but this, the outcome is that we're not gonna go ahead of this, we're gonna kill this project. Uh, yeah. that, that's a really valuable learning in, in, in many ways. Uh, but you, you, your spot on facilitation is uh, structure, uh, applying different frameworks, methodologies, and. One piece of advice I would say to anybody working in innovation or is looking to facilitate or lead the team is um, do use these methodologies and frameworks to create structure, uh, but don't be completely wedded to them. Uh, I think in a single project, with my experience, typically I would maybe combine three or four different methodologies, maybe more at times. Um, and if I see if something is not working, then I would, I would stop, I'll take it out. Um, don't just follow them blindly read read the situation read the room read the context and and adapt accordingly um whilst being comfortable with working in that very ambiguous yeah. um, i think uh, structure it's it's interesting i mean it's one of those things obviously with time and confidence as you've obviously clearly developed that becomes easier mm -hmm. um i think so that's why i do suggest having someone there to facilitate who knows what they're doing as a you know, as a starting point, don't just jump in two feet blindly to something, get some help, get some, if you can, get a mentor, get someone that can give you some advice on this. Um, even if you don't have, you know, that person in-house, seek, seek that guidance. With everything that we're discussing, mm -hmm. obviously, one of the things that springs to mind is what the future looks like. Well, this current decade, 2020 to 2030, has been described um, as the decade of action. Um, we we have some as as a as a collective human race and civilization we by 2030 we have some very clear targets that we need to achieve um set by you know the 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 UN sustainable development goals uh, back in 2016 and recently reinforced again so we know that we have to halve the global carbon emissions by 2030 and if you think a whole industry, or, you know, a, a world and industry, the economies are built on, in many ways, all the, all the industries are producing carbon. So that's the, the biggest challenge, um, one of the biggest challenges, not the only one that needs to change and is going to impact businesses. So when we think about innovation is we've got to be 
purpose driven to to fundamentally change and, and you know reduce eradicate carbon carbon emissions from from our supply chains value chains the way of, of doing things um and so that's just one challenge that sustainability brings and why sustainability is interesting is because even if we don't think so on a particular topic, it just doesn't impact me or my organization severely or directly. Um, it absolutely will for an accumulative effect later down the line. And you ha we all have to take this more longer term perspective and thinking um, and, 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 and take action. You know, um, I think with got to a point, especially with the recent, a uh, recent book called Earth for All, I highly encourage everybody to read it. Uh, it's, a, it's a guide to, a survival guide for humanity. And it talks about um, actually what are the things that we need to fundamentally change in order to, to have a future um, to innovate towards. So um, not, to, not to say this in a, in, a, in a bleak way, but if we talk about innovation, um, what is the point of innovating if we if we have no, no no future to protect um or innovate for so that should be the priority that's what we should be innovating towards and and that is why i've wanted to dedicate all my energy you know experience and um collaborations with people on focusing on on just that um i uh, I, I want to try and uh, and drive action towards towards that space so the way to do that with all these challenges the how they're different and we talk about the free horizons uh, the different levels of innovation. Um, there's new emerging technologies that that can help uh, that can help us or hinder us. The thing that connects all of this is that these are these challenges are system wide. Um, they touch many. There are many sub components, and in order to come up with breakthrough ideas to fundamentally rethink or reimagine the future, change our reality, as we talked about earlier, uh, solve those bigger systemic problems. Uh, collaboration is key. We, no one organization can tackle these things. No one government can tackle these things. We need to work together. Uh, we need to create the, the right incentives for us to work together to move towards real tangible outcomes that benef benefit the, the many. Um, and this opens the door to a whole nother discussion of, you know, we talked about in order for collaboration to exist, you need system, you need structure. So does our current structure at a more macro level serve us to be able to collaborate to tackle these systemic challenges? Well, arguably no, our, our current, you know, operating system, if I can call it that, is, is failing us. And there are many evidences of that failing across societies uh, and, and companies um, in general. Um, so what is a current system? Well, that's our neoliberal capitalist uh, economy that, that exists today. And, you know, capitalism served us well for, for a long time. Uh, but we may need to rethink it. And this is where, you know, I, I came across this new, um, new m economic model at the University of Cambridge um, that talks about this idea of a moving, shifting towards a well-being economy. And the well-being economy is this idea of creating products and services and investing our resources in finances to creating positive social and environmental outcomes, which in return will also bring commercial benefit. 100%. I mean, you've hit the, you've hit the nail on the head when uh, you said, what is the point of innovation if there's nothing left to innovate for? You know, if we, if we are fundamentally not here as a species, then there'll be nothing left for us to work on. And I think when you're talking about the, the current economic situation, I think nothing highlights the way that this system is failing us more than what's currently happened with Thames Water. And the fact that this organization that is in service of millions of people has been bled dry, for want of a better term, of all of, it, all of its profits and resources by foreign investors. And now it is to be picked up by the tab, will be picked up by the taxpayer. But that doesn't serve us. What should be really happening is those profits that it's generating should have been recirculated back into our economy, into our well-being economy, which means that we would have been better able to fund services like the NHS, like improving waterways and fur further bettering the service that was already there, not making and lining the pockets of those who are already rich. 
And that may be unpopular for some to hear, but without a shift and without a change and a challenge to what is currently going on, there is going to be a point at which we will not need innovation anymore because we won't be here anymore. And that is the existential crisis uh, climate change we are, we are facing and why sustainable innovation is so key and so, poor, so important now. And while it is necessary, there is no denial of the fact that that change will probably be uncomfortable for some and necessarily so. Absolutely, yeah. Danny, thank you so much for today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Uh, I've really enjoyed today's discussion and I think we've got a lot more to discuss in a future episode. So where can people find you? How can they engage with you? How can they get in touch with you in, in, in future? Yeah, so you can, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Danny L. Zane. Uh, you could also contact me on radicalworkshop.com, uh, which is a service as part of Radical Everyone that facilitates uh, innovation workshops, discovery sessions, design sprints to tackle problems, uh, to develop breakthrough thinking um, for sustainability and, and other challenges. And, uh, and also on Twitter, it's the handle Danny underscore um, L Zane. So there you have it from the man himself. Reach out to Danny if you would like to ask him any more questions and would like to continue today's discussion. If you'd like to give us feedback, it's hello at explosivebrands.com or give us feedback or a rating on wherever you are listening to or watching this episode. Thank you so much and we really look forward to seeing you again soon.